Praise the Lord. Our Father, we thank you for bringing us to the climax, the conclusion of what we started the first day. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the training. Thank you for the transformation. Thank you for reminding us of what to expect as you give us the great commission that will reach out and launch out everywhere preaching the gospel, this same gospel of the kingdom all over the world to every creature. We're asking, oh Lord, everything we have heard will remain, abide in us till the end in Jesus' name. Your word will not be lost on us. Lord, your spirit will remind us every time what you want us to do, where you want us to do it, and when and how it ought to be done. I will pray the might, the heart that always listens to the Holy Spirit as he guides, as he leads. You grant to everyone in Jesus' name. And the days to come, and the years to come, if Jesus tarries, will be years of faithfulness, years of fruitfulness, and years of obedience to the heavenly vision. We pray, Lord, you stamp the word in every heart, and you help us to be sensitive to the calling, to the consecration, to the commitment, to the great commission. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. Consider we're coming to Joshua chapter 24. And I'm reading from verse 15, Joshua chapter 24 verse 15 and if it seem evil unto you to serve the lord choose you this day whom ye will serve whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You understand? You are not taking that verse in isolation. Joshua was now old, aged, streaking in years, and yet. He didn't lose control of his family. At old age, he didn't give up. Almost blind, some, almost a kind of confined to a seat. Some people almost having a mind, a brain that cannot reason, that cannot work. Some almost saying the same thing he just said it now where is so and so oh, they said papa he is there and five minutes after having forgotten what was said five minutes earlier i said where is so and so and they say we told you ah okay you told me where is he is over there joshua did not have any of that he was still in control of his mind, in control of his conviction, in control of the command that the Lord had given, that the man is the head of the home. And he said, yes, I'm old, yes, I'm aged, I'm streaking in years, yet as for me and my house, we will serve 
the Lord. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, it says, And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey, like Joshua said, all the people of Israel, they did not have any other commitment. They did not have any other direction. They were looking at Joshua. At your age, Joshua, even with all your family and the wife, of course, did not say, old man, things are different now. We cannot continue just to follow you. Now we have a mind. Okay, 50 50, you decide 50% of the time, and we decide 50% of the time. No, as for me and my house, a hundred percent, we will serve the Lord. And the people, seeing the good example of Joshua at such an age. The people said, the Lord our God, will we serve? And his voice, will we obey? Look at verse 31. Verse 31. Verse 31 tells us, and Israel served the Lord. All the days of Joshua, they served the Lord. They were not here and there, up and down down loose and firm decisive and indecisive no the whole of the children of israel they served the lord all the days of joshua and all the days of the elders that overlaid joshua which had known all the works of the lord that he had done for Israel. We're talking about the covenant of acceptable service unto God. When you open your mouth and you say, I will obey the Lord, it's a covenant you are making of the Lord. I will serve the Lord in every detail that He commands and demands. You are making a covenant with the Lord. When you say, I will not turn to the right, I will not turn to the left, everything he says, every day of my life, whatever the challenge, rain or sunshine, I will follow the Lord. You're making a covenant with the Lord. When you say, whatever others do i am going through i am going through and every day every moment of my life i will carry out everything i open my mouth to tell the lord you're making a covenant with the lord and in this final chapter of joshua the people made a covenant of acceptable service unto god three things we're looking at Number one, fresh recollection of the history of their redemption. Fresh recollection of the history of their redemption. Number two, firm recommitment with heart for revealed responsibility. The Lord revealed their responsibility to them and they were firm in their recommitment with their heart, from their heart, in their heart, that they were recommitting themselves wholeheartedly to the revealed responsibility. And then number three is final redirection towards heavenly home going for rest and for rewards we're looking at number one number one is the fresh recollection of the history of their redemption we're dividing this to three parts dividing it to three parts we're looking at number one the obedience of faith for personal redemption Number two, the obligation of forsaking 
favors for national redemption. Number three, the occupation of the false and their perpetual rejection. Number one, number one is the obedience of faith for personal redemption. In Joshua chapter 24, reading from verse 1. Joshua chapter 24, verse 1. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to shake him and call for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. He was going to have a leadership congress before eventually passed on. Old, stricken in years, and yet he called the excellent, the top level leaders in the land, in every tribe, all the elders, all their judges, and all their officers, and they presented themselves before God, you see, what God commands to be done and what we have been doing, the age or the strength or the health of the leader should not stop. We should not say, let's pity Joshua. Look at his age. And there was no microphone at that time. And all these gadgets that help us, this time, they were not there. And yet, when the voice, rapsy voice, whatever, that he had at that time, all the leaders, all the elders, all the judges, all the officers must be together that Joshua will give them the final commission in the final congress he will have with them we're told in verse 2 in verse 2 it says and joshua said unto all the people thus thus says the lord god of israel your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time even terror the father of abraham and the father of nahor and they served all the gods verse three in verse three and i took your father abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of canaan and multiplied the seed and gave him Isaac. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau, and I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. This was just a reminder for them of the history of their fathers and for fathers and here he talked about the obedience of faith for their personal redemption hebrews chapter 11 we're looking at verse 8 in hebrews 11 verse 8 by faith abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance he obeyed by faith abraham obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went the same thing the lord is commanding us today abraham that went before them had obedience of faith and the people that have gone before us they had obedience of faith it reminds us of the history of the covenant people of god faith and obedience obedience and faith the obedience of 
faith. Look at Romans chapter 16, reading from verse 25. In Romans chapter 15, verse 25, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was a kept secret since the world began. Verse 26, in verse 26, but now is made manifest, made known, revealed, and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations made known to all for what purpose for what reason for the obedience of faith every message we hear here or in the church or in our local churches is for the obedience of faith do we talk about repentance while we preaching repentance for the obedience of faith are we talking about restitution why for the obedience of faith are we talking of implicit faith in god not depending on any outside power but on the power of the lord what do we talk about faith because of the obedience of faith we preach evangelism go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature why why such a message for the obedience of faith marriage one man one wife until death do us part why for the obedience of faith we talk about the coming of the lord about the rapture he is coming and he can come any moment and any time from now why are we preaching that for the obedience of faith will preach judgment to come it's appointed unto men wants to die but after this the judgment why for the obedience of faith every message will preach every message will listen to there is something there to take note of by everyone for the obedience of faith we're looking at number two number two is the obligation of forsaking favors for national redemption that is those who are going to be involved like you and i those who are going to be responsible for taking the message of life the message of salvation and the gospel of the kingdom you are going to be responsible to taking that out there is the obligation of forsaking favors if you are going to be useful in national redemption we're looking at joshua chapter 24 reading from verse 5 it says and I sent Moses also, and Aaron, and plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them, and afterward I brought you out. I ransomed you. I redeemed you. Look at verse 6. In verse 6 it says, and I brought your fathers out of egypt and ye came unto the sea and the egyptians pursued after your fathers which with chariots and with horsemen unto the red sea verse seven in verse seven and when they cried unto the lord he put darkness between you and the egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them and your eyes have seen what i have done in egypt and ye dwelt in the wilderness long season verse 8 in verse 8 and i brought you into 
the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side, Jordan, they fought with you. And I gave them into your hand that ye might possess their land and I destroyed them from before you. Now, he talks about Moses. He's talking about Abraham. He's now talking about Moses that was instrumental. The two and the battle acts in the hand of God to bring them out of Egypt and to bring them into the wilderness and now further into the land of promise. But you know, Moses used by God for the redemption of the nation. He had the obligation of forsaking favors. If we are going to be used in the mighty hand of the Lord to save nations, to save continents, and to save people from all over the world, there is, number one, the obedience of faith. Number two, there is the obligation of forsaking favors. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Reading from verse 24, it says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Many favors, many advantages accrued to being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter because the daughter was heir to the throne, but as a female, she couldn't rule over the nation of Israel. And so she was happy to adopt Moses as her own son, because now what she could not do by the constitution of the land, her son, being a man, cannot do it. But Moses refused. Moses said that favor of ruling over Egypt, one nation, I don't accept. He refused that. You see, if we're going to rescue any nation, if we're going to be used in the redemption of any nation, there are some favors, there are some blessings, there are some normal, normal things we have to refuse. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, choosing rather to suffer, it's a choice. You could dodge it. You could escape it. You could say, suffer? No. Suffer for anyone? No. Suffer. I know Pharaoh. I know Egypt. And if I reject the favor and I come back now and I say, let my people go, I know them too much to endanger my life. But he chose it. There are things we choose. They're not comfortable. They're not easy. They are not commendable. They bring pain. They bring displeasure. They bring suffering. But if we're going to be used of God to save a nation, to redeem a nation, to bring redemption to a nation, to a continent, or to the world, there are things we have to choose. You choose to suffer. If you don't do it, don't go that way. Too much commitment, the suffering will be less. Too much consecration, the suffering will be less. And too much going up and down here and there to bring the gospel everywhere, the suffering might be less. But we choose to suffer all that we need to suffer like Moses and we reject the uh, we reject the favors of the world that we will be, we will do what they have called us to do, choosing rather to suffer affliction 
with the people of God and to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. In verse 27, it says, My faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. What people let down, what people let go, what people chicken out, why people dodge responsibility because of the wrath of the powers that be. And because of their wrath, if a pharaoh gets angry, it's not a superficial anger. He does something against whom he had the anger against. If a Nebuchadnezzar gets angry. It's not a pleasant anger. It's superficial, empty anger. It does something, something unexpected, something deadly, something dangerous against the people. He yeah, had a fury and the furnace waiting for them. If a herald gets angry, wrath, it's not an empty rod, an empty thread. It does something, yet we're told by faith. It forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Look at uh, Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, here is Jesus saying, I'm sending you forth to preach the gospel to all nations and you have to forsake some favors because of that. Look at Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If any man come to me, and hate not, I'm sure, your Bible, your preachers, yourself. You know, this is not talking of hatred, animosity against father or mother or wife. It's comparison. Jacob, have I loved? And Esau, have I hated? It's not hatred of denying him what he ought to have. But he was a man of the flesh. God was still giving rain for his farm, sunshine for his uh, produce. And God was still giving him good sleep in the night. But the spiritual blessing, to be a blessing to the rest of the world, that's what Esau did not have. Esau have I hated, and Jacob have I loved. It's comparison. And when you come into the kingdom, and you're going to serve the Lord, your love for your father, for your mother, for your wife, for your brethren, for your sisters, all that kind of love still remains. But the love you have for God, and the love you have for spreading the gospel goes far beyond the love you have for your human relations that they will count it as hatred. Uh -uh. <laughs> the, all the time you give to the church, you cannot give as much that time to us. You hate us. All the excitement, all the money, all the contribution you give for the spreading of the gospel, you cannot give that to us. When they compare, it's like hatred. And all the devotion, all the consecration you give to the spreading 
of the gospel you cannot give that to us it will be like hatred to them so that's the hatred that is but it's a word of comparison it says if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters yea and his own life also how do we hate our own life also do we commit suicide and cut our throat that's not what he's talking about how do we hate our own life also do we uh, not we avoid giving necessary food and necessary rest to the body? No, that's it, Jesus said, come ye yourself apart and rest a while because they had no leisure even to eat. No, it's not talking of that. It's talking of driving. It's talking of going. It's talking of pushing. It's talking you know, of doing the work of God and others are saying, sir, be slow, sir. You, you are not as strong as you were 30 years ago. Slow down. And he refuses to slow down. And the Lord keeps giving the strength. That's the hatred he's talking about. His own life also. If he doesn't do that, he cannot be my disciple. Look at verse 27. Verse 27. And whosoever does not bear his cross ah, the disciple the follower of Christ the one who died for us on the cross of Calvary everyone has a cross it might be a personal challenge and yet you carry that personal challenge and you're still preaching the gospel it might be to the knowledge of the public that they say look at this and you're still carrying the gospel and you're still going forth with the gospel they might say others he saves but he cannot save his whole family and they say look at that look at that young man is a son to this preacher that is going about and is uh, you know getting other people saved others is saved he cannot save his own household look at that man and look at this and look at this that's the cross and you don't dodge the cross you don't avoid the cross whosoever does not bear his cross look at that it doesn't say whosoever does not bear a cross no he soon cross what are the challenges in your life that makes you to say because of this pain because of this problem because of this challenge i've been praying and fasting about it and it has not been resolved because of that i tender my leave of absence i'll come back but i want this thing to be suffered that is the cross and whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple cannot be my mouthpiece cannot be my minister cannot be my missionary we're coming to point number three here number three is the occupation of the false and their perpetual rejection we're looking at Joshua chapter 24 and we're reading from verse 9 Joshua chapter 24 verse 9 then Balak the son of Zippor king of Moab arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam the son of Baal to curse you verse 10 but I would not hearken 
unto Balaam. He will not hack into the people that want to destroy you. Amen. You know, as we go along in this work that he has given us to do, we have God on our side supporting us. And we have Satan on the other side opposing the spread of the gospel. And yet we know there's no comparison. Our God is not comparable with Satan. And he'll bring that Satan under your feet shortly. As we continue in the work, we have the promises of God. The promises that can never fail. On the other hand, we also have the problems and the challenges. But there is no comparison. The problem will not overturn the promise in your life in Jesus' name. We just have to realize that while the positive, the practical, the powerful is there on the one hand, the problems and the people of evil, they are there on the other hand. And if we look at the other side, we will lose the confidence and the faith we have on the side of the Lord. But there was a Balaam. Therefore, he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hand. Every evil power, the Lord will deliver us out of their hand. Every magician, every occultic man, every idolatrous man, the Lord will deliver you in particular from their hands in Jesus' name. Balaam will not have the final say in your life. You know what? I don't understand how people like Balaam think. He knew the power of the God of Israel. He knew. He himself said, I see him, but not now. It's coming. He that shall rule. And he knew that God had made that decision and that decree. It was going to be done. And yet, an angel has spoken to him. Your way is perverse before me. Go back. Because you are not doing the right thing. Those people are blessed. You cannot curse them. I don't understand how people like that will still remain heady and their head went ahead to block their progress. Balaam. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, And ye went over Jordan and came unto Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you. They will fight but they will not overcome you. The Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Gagashites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and I, and I delivered them into your hand. You lost a good amen. And then in verse 12, in verse 12 it says, And I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow, where we will overcome. Every Balaam in your way will be taken out of your way in Jesus' name. But you know what? We sometimes have, we new creatures in Christ. We have the old, old concept 
before we came to Christ. The average African fears witches. I will fear them before we came to Christ. We have come to Christ and the average new creature when they hear of which is the same old fear still grieves them but any fear should not grip you they will not touch you if they touch you they touch the apple of the eye of the lord the almighty will deal with them when we were at school maybe we have heard the stories of those occultic gangs deadly dangerous but now we're converted unfortunately the same fear we had in the past before we came to christ of those occultic gangs we still have the same fear and if we're going to preach now in the places where those occultic gangs hold sway we featured and we fear the new creature should not have that kind of fear if the old fear raising up its ugly heads we will walk over them we will overcome them before we came to christ we used to fear those terrifying dreams you know well, we'll wake up in the morning, we'll be sweating. And then we might try down the dream. Terrifying, terrible. That was the old life. Why? Do we still fear that kind of dream in the new life? We shouldn't. Because the new creature is a new creation with new confidence. And with new faith and with new overcoming power everything we feared in the past together with Balaam we overcome them today in Jesus name we're coming now to point number two in point number two firm recommitment with heart for revealed responsibility we're dividing this to three parts number one exemplary commitment to serve the lord in all sincerity and truth serve the lord if insincerity comes into your service you're no more serving the lord if hypocrisy pretends and covered up modified lie comes into your service you are no more serving in the lord but exemplary commitment to serve the lord in all sincerity and truth number two entire consecration to serve the lord with absolute surrender and trust absolute surrender and trust the reason you're able to surrender is because you trust the lord you trust him that his promise cannot fail you know the end from the beginning like god himself and uh, you count the thing done before they are even started you have that trust in the lord that's why you have absolute surrender you know it happens to children and um, you know daddy says uh, give me that thing i'll give you something better and the human nature and the property that child will say no daddy give me first let me see what you are giving me before i drop this they don't have the absolute surrender because they don't have trust there are people who are church men and church women also they behave like those children they don't have absolute trust in the lord because of that they don't have absolute surrender they must manage something 
they must do something they don't want to leave everything in their lives in the hand of god they expect that will be disappointing but the people who consecrate entirely entire consecration to serve the lord with absolute surrender and trust number three enduring condition of separation unto god with sanctification and transparency let's come to number one number one we're looking at exemplary commitment to serve the lord in all sincerity and truth joshua chapter 24 we're looking at verse 13 in joshua chapter 24 verse 13 and i have given you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities which ye built not, and ye dwell in them, of the vineyards and of the olive years, which ye planted not, do ye eat. Verse 14, in verse 14, now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity, and in truth serve the lord if you want to serve the lord it has to be in sincerity sincerity with no stain of pretense no stain of make-believe no stain of just acting like chameleons here in the open like that and there in the private like that when he knows when she knows if i try to pretend here everybody will see this so they do well this one nobody can tell and they do otherwise there's no sincerity there and here joshua said they should serve the lord in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Verse 15, in verse 15, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord and to serve him only, to serve the Lord and to serve him with all your heart. If that is evil to you, to put all your eggs in the gospel basket. And you have the ideology, you have the opinion. Don't put your eggs in one basket. Your love into one gospel basket your faith into one gospel basket don't put all your energy everything you have into one gospel basket share them well because it seems evil unto you that you're not going to put all your heart all your mind all your strength and everything you've got unto God. It says, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, whose land, in whose land ye dwell, but as for me as for me an old man an aged man that knows he will soon get to the grave 